Hi, I'm David Wood. And this is a jargon-free introduction to linked data, originally presented at the 2013 Health Data Palooza in Washington, D.C. with Bernadette Highland. We're producing data at a faster rate than ever before. And it's not slowing down. Matter of fact, it's going to get a lot worse really soon. If you listen to the media, the press, you could be forgiven for thinking that growth is driven by social media alone. We hear a tremendous amount about how big Facebook is or how many people go on Twitter. Every now and again, we hear about all the email that's being sent. But the data actually suggests that web usage dwarfs human-to-human -human contact in any form. Have a look at these numbers. About 230 million tweets are sent per day, but almost 300 billion email. Plus, we know that tweets are limited to 140 characters, where emails often contain attachments and lengthy missives. So emails not only dwarf the number of tweets, but they dwarf the size of tweets as well. Email and tweets are both human-to-human -human contact. It's one person telling another person or group of people something that they, they want them to know. Web usage is typically different. When we go on the web, we're gathering information, we're formulating opinions, we're trying to learn something. Now we don't have a good way of figuring out just how many people look at how many web pages per day. For both issues of practicality and privacy, it's very difficult to figure that out. But there is a segment of the industry that tracks web page hits very, very carefully. These are the ad networks. Online ad impressions can serve as a very rough proxy for how much people are using the web. If we look at that data against the sizes of email and tweets, we say that, see that 4.8 trillion online ad impressions are made every day on the web. That's pretty big. So even though we don't have an exact number, we can say one thing for sure. The amount of information that is searched and read on the web dwarfs emails, which in turn dwarfs tweets. Even Facebook usage is way down at the bottom under this amount of web content. So people are accessing and evaluating data at a much bigger, uh, in much larger quantities, and at a much faster rate than they're sharing it with each other. If you think about it, that's actually probably what we expect to happen. Now, who's creating this data? That can be a little tricky to say, but I'll throw out one thing for you to consider. If we look at the United States alone, roughly 300 million people, about a third of those people use software on a routine basis. So about half of those people are users of spreadsheets or databases. About a third of those, down to about 13 million, are so-called end-user programmers. These are the people who are maybe creating SQL queries. They are writing spreadsheet functions. They're maybe writing a, a macro in, a, in an editor of some form or a, a word processor. These people are about four times as large as a group of those who self-identify as professional programmers. So what we see is that most programs today, even if they're little teeny programs, are written not by professional software developers, but by people with problems to solve, who use computers to solve those problems. These are users of Excel and Word, maybe scientists who, who use the R programming language. They're people who aren't primarily software developers, but they're the ones writing our programs. They're the ones creating our data. Back in 2010, Tim Berners-Lee gave a now infamous talk at the Gov 2.0 uh, conference in Washington, D.C., he brought up some interesting points about the physical world and the data in the physical world and how it relates to information on the web. I'm going to share that with you now. On this bag of chips, 
there's some information on the front. Gives the manufacturer's name, talks about what the product is. It's clearly readable by people. On the back is some information that's readable by motivated people in a smaller font. Things like the nutrition facts or maybe the website of the manufacturer. There's also a little bit of machine readable information on there in the form of a barcode. Those are things that are scanned on checkout when you, when you go to pay at the till. We've seen this pattern before where some information is presented in human readable form and some information is presented in machine-readable form on the same piece of content. Further, the schemas or vocabularies that describe how this data is to be presented come from a variety of different organizations. Hairs, the manufacturer here, wrote on the back of their own package. Surely they're allowed to do that. But we have these nutrition facts from the USDA that present standard nutrition information in a way, in a layout, in using vocabulary that's specific to the United States. So not only is the back of this package in English, but it's in U.S. English with information that's presented by the U.S. government. We also have some other organizations that provide some vocabulary information here. The United States Postal Service defines the physical address format, the International Telecommunications Union, the format for the telephone number, the Internet Engineering Task Force defines what a web address looks like. Then there's ISO and GS1 who are responsible for the barcodes for manufacturers. Look down here in the lower left. There's another little number down there. It says REG period and a number. It's a registration number of some form. We don't know whose registration number it is and we don't care. The average eater of a bag of chips probably doesn't care about most of this information. But if they want to look, if they want to read this information, they can read, and they can look, they can figure out the phone number on how to call hairs, they can figure out how many calories are in the bag, but somebody else, say the checkout clerk at the store, can scan that barcode. Who's the registration number for? We don't know and we don't care, but we can rest assured that whoever needed that information had it when they look at the bag, maybe somewhere in the manufacturing or shipping process. The people who define our formats and our schemas on the web are also outside of our control and they're also distributed all over the world. Facebook comes up with their own formats. So does Twitter. So does Wikipedia. They all do. We don't have any control over these at all any more than we have control over who's on the, bag, the back of the bag of chips. Importantly though, enterprises pretend that they don't have to work this way. Enterprises have historically pretended that they control all their schemas in their databases, maybe to a lesser degree in their spreadsheets. They have full-time database administrators who oversee what information can be put into one of their corporate databases. These enterprises have historically pretended their knowledge workers get their data solely from these centralized IT department controlled databases. The schema for those databases can only be updated by a few designated individuals and only then under carefully controlled circumstances. In reality though, knowledge workers are grabbing data from a variety of enterprise, online, and physical sources in order to perform their work. When they go out and get information from a database, or from a spreadsheet, or from the web, or from some physical items like a book or even the back of the bag of chips. They're doing this, they're gathering information in order to produce new knowledge, in order to learn something, often to produce a report, and then the cycle continues. Even worse, when the information that they're gathering uh, is in 
spreadsheet form or, or a word processing document, they're often promulgated by email. Who has an inbox that looks like this? We get a lot of copies of these same files over and over and over again. Librarians know this problem. They call it the appropriate copy problem. Which one should be used? How should it be presented? Who sent the last one? Is the data up to date? This can be a hard problem, even if the information is virtual. Even worse, maybe, because we can make so many copies so cheaply. We'd like to address these challenges by making data more findable and reusable on the web. Because the web, of course, is the way that we find most of our data. These days, if we want to find a physical item, we might go out to Amazon or eBay. We're looking on the web for information that describes a physical item that we may not actually have in front of us. If we're getting information from our corporate databases, it's becoming very common for the way we access that information to be via a web interface. Even if that information is coming from a big traditional vendor like Microsoft or IBM or Oracle. So we find, buy, describe our physical objects via the web. We find and reuse our corporate information via the web. And of course, we find and use information through Google, other search engines, other websites, all day, every day, on a daily basis. The biggest problem that we have today in trying to use data, we have a lot of it, we have the web, which should help us. Unfortunately, the web today, be it internal or external to an enterprise, is not currently helping us find and reuse our data very well at all. We put a lot of data on the web, and we link to it. However, the things that we link to, the data elements, don't have addresses. They're not unique. We have a hard time finding them. So we typically hide them behind web pages. Further, the information is often in a proprietary format. How many years is it going to be before we can't open, much less reuse, the Excel files that we're producing today, or that we produced 10 years ago? What if we can't find a version of Excel that will even open that file? That data is effectively lost to us. Further, most of our data today is formatted for human consumption. It's presented for humans to create and for humans to use. Well, that's a scaling problem right there. This information is not easy for automated processes to access, to search, and reuse. Further processing by people is almost always required for the data to be incorporated into new projects. We think we can do better. We have one big problem. The biggest single problem we have with almost all of our data is a lack of context. That's because most of our data processing tools allow us to create data without defining context in the first place. That's okay, but it makes it very difficult for others to understand and reuse it later. We have this problem ourselves. Go back and look at a project or a, a spreadsheet that you created six months ago. See if you can remember that context. Sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Look at this little spreadsheet here. It's only two columns and a handful of rows. The left column says day, and that's pretty clear. The right column says temp. Well, does that mean temporary, or does it mean temperature? It might mean temperature, because there are numbers in the column. What then are the temperatures? Uh, are they in degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius or some other scale? Where is this data recorded? Who recorded it? And what day format is that in anyway? Uh, the dates are ambiguous. They could be day-month-year in Europe or month-day-year in the United States. It's hard to say. If you guess, you might get it wrong. What we'd like to do is add context to our data, at least the data that becomes important later. We'd like to layer on context 
when we know that we want to use this data or we want to share it, we want to pass it around. We want to have some mechanism to capture that information that we didn't necessarily find important when we created the data in the first place. We'd like to be able to say that the first column is a, is a date in day, month, year format. The second column is a temperature in degrees Celsius. And this data was collected by Michael Hassenbloss at Galway Airport in Ireland. We might have a date on that too. Once we have that context, it's really easy to model the relationships. Each relationship is just, it's just two things and the relationship between them. Each little bit of data is linked to another via one of these little links, much like a hyperlink on the web. And you can think of it just like that, especially if we can give these data elements unique universal addresses, web addresses. We might even want to put some of this data on the web. If we name at least some of our data elements using web addresses and actually host them on the web, we can start to serve our data from a web server down to the element level. We could distribute it over the web or hold it all in our own little bucket. We can do the same thing with our vocabularies or schema information about them. In this case, we've got some data. We said it was collected at Galway Airport. Well, we can point off to Wikipedia and say that we're going to use the same identifier for Galway Airport that Wikipedia does. We could hold all the information about who collected the data, or maybe, as in this case, we could point off to their Facebook account, let Facebook hold the details about who that person is. Further, we can follow or ignore the links we like, just like the registration number on the bag of chips. We don't need to understand all the data, or all the schemas in the world before we can do something useful. We just need to understand the data that we care about in context, just like when we pick up that bag of chips. So what have we talked about? We said that data's got a lot of problems. We have a lot of it. We're going to have more. We have a lot of proprietary containers. We need to be able to archive our data in an open manner so we can make sure we get to it later. We need to be able to record our data context and not necessarily right away, but later when we know that that data is useful. We might want to record who collected that data and when. Who says that these things are true? We call this provenance, but the term's not particularly important. How can we know whether our data is up to date or not? How can we share our data with others? This is probably the most important thing of all. Linked data, linked data is one way to answer these questions. It's a pretty good way because it has some properties that we really like. First of all, it's defined by a series of international standards from the World Wide Web Consortium. It's natively grounded in the World Wide Web and the web is our database. It is the way that we modern humans find and access our information. Having a web way to deal with our data is a very useful concept. It provides a way to layer in context, provenance, and access at a later time. It allows us to share our data in a way that others can understand it. It allows for both human and machine reuse so we can stop recreating the wheel. There are four linked data principles. They're not very complicated. The first one is to name data files and elements, or at least some of them, with web addresses. We want to use those web addresses so people can resolve them, so they can read more information about them if they don't understand. If I say that this particular thing is a temperature, and you don't know what a temperature is, or you don't know what the unit of measure is, you can just resolve that web address and go read about it. We want to provide that useful information at those web addresses using the standards so that everybody's using the same data model. 
everybody's approaching the problem in the same way. That makes data sharing easy. Further, we want to include links in our data to other people's data so people can discover more information. That's the same mechanism that built the web. There are books on linked data. I encourage you to go read some of them. If you're a web developer, you might be interested in linked data from Manning in the upper right or linked data evolving the web into a global data space in the lower left. Either of those are good for web developers. Academics might be interested in the ones in the upper right, linking government data or linking enterprise data from Springer. If you're a manager and you want a high-level overview of why linked data is useful to you, you might want to look at linked data, linked open data, the essentials from the Semantic Web Company in Austria. It's available in PDF or in print form. I'd like to give credit to the people who helped me put this presentation together. Not all the images are mine. Not all the logos are mine. My work is released under a Creative Commons license. You can share and remix this information any way you, lo you like, as long as you give us attribution and, and share alike under a similar license. This has been Linked Data, the jargon-free version, by David Wood and Bernadette Highland. I hope you enjoyed it.